Hello and welcome back to this episode of 8-Bit Unboxing. We're going to unbox all of the things that you guys have donated to me uh, during the months of May and June of 2018. So I didn't really get enough stuff in June to do a full episode, but uh, during the uh, last two months I've definitely received a lot of interesting things. So uh, let's take a look. Ok, so this is the first package, and I have to admit being stumped as to who this was from or what it was, because it just says an artist on Redbubble. Now, later I realized it was from Clayton Hickman, and uh, so there are a couple of t-shirts, and apparently Clayton likes to make obscure t-shirts that reference things that are just seen for a short time in a single episode of, of TV shows, and I think he wanted to send me these Doctor Who shirts to see if I could recognize what they were. Well, <laughs> I certainly recognized this logo right away. This was only seen in the episode Castrovalva, uh, originally broadcast in 1982, and it's one of my favorite episodes, so uh, yeah, I got that one. TARDIS INFORMATION SYSTEM! Let's see what the other one is. Ah, and this, uh, ah yes, I, I also immediately recognize this. This is the Dark Tower from the Death Zone on Gallifrey, uh, but more specifically it's the computer representation shown on the screen inside of the TARDIS. Now, as far as I can make out, there are three entrances. Anyway, uh, very nice. Uh, I will definitely wear these. Moving on, the next package is from Lane Mason. And here's a note. Ok, it looks like he sent me some replacement gears for my Armatron. Let's have a look. Well, I only needed one, and now it looks like I have a stockpile of them. Well, thank you Lane, I will probably put this to use soon. Um, these are 3D printed by the way, and while I received a million emails telling me to do this, I already had a 3D printer, but mine was simply not capable of producing these. Next up we have a box here, and it is from Charles Bozarth. And uh, what do we have here? Oh cool, I remember this discussion. I don't normally take printers for a variety of reasons, uh, but this was too good to turn down. It's an Okimate 10 in the original box and it looks brand new. The Okimate was a very unusual printer for the time. See what your computer can do when it stops playing games. Uh, this was a color thermal printer that came out at a time when all other printers were either dot matrix or daisy wheel, both of which were very loud and obnoxious. These, on the other hand, were practically silent and could print in vibrant color. Um, let's take a closer look inside the box. Hey, look at this. Uh, Charles even printed something on it for me. Surprisingly, it still appears to mostly work with the original cartridge. And here it is. Um, I'll draw your attention to this area here. You see, this printer was brilliant because it could interface with various different brands by changing the interface cartridge. And uh, right now it has a cartridge for the Commodore machines. And it looks like there's some software here too. Uh, well, thank you Charles. Ok, well moving right along we've got something here from Thomas. And I thought this might be a bill, but uh, I felt something inside of it. And uh, take a look at that, even more Armatron gears. I have enough to fix like 20 Armatrons now. <laughs> well, uh, thank you Thomas. Next I got a little something here from Ollie's. Oh look, there's my logo. Ok, uh, that's interesting. Um, here's a note. Looks like a custom 8-bit guy letterhead here. Anyway, it looks like he sent me a nightstand for my Apple Watch, which uh, looks like an old Macintosh. Uh, well, uh, let's try it out. Ok, so it plops in there like that. I guess you would have to mount the magnetic charger in the back before it really works properly though. Still, uh, you can see what it would look like. Uh, well, nice, uh, thank you. Next up we've got a big old box here, and this is apparently from David Tanning Machine. <laughs> that, that probably has some meaning that has escaped me. Uh, here's a note. Ok, apparently he's sending me some sort of keyboard, and uh, ah, uh, Tanning Machine is the name of his band. Ok, uh, so what we have here is a Bone Tempe electronic computer organ. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this kid isn't posing here at all, right? <laughs> uh, well, uh, let's see if we can get it out. This is definitely not the original packing material. This design looks very 1970s. Well, uh, this should be something interesting to play with, so uh, thank you Tanning Machine. And next up we have a big box from the Home Depot. <laughs> ok, not really. Uh, it's from Anti Bichonin? Is that a name or a company? I'm not sure. <laughs> well, let's open it. Ok, wow, um, there are quite a few things in this box. So first we have a digital sound lab here. Never heard of this, but it looks interesting. And then a light and learn, <laughs> never heard of this one. And next we have a talk 
Talking Teacher. Again, never heard of this, but it uh, looks interesting. It's made by Coleco. What's next? Hit Sticks 2. <laughs> These sticks look remarkably similar to the Casio sticks I reviewed a while back, but instead of attaching to a keyboard, they appear to be connected to a proprietary little beatbox. I'm sure they're just as terrible and gimmicky to use, but uh, I'll check it out. Ah, the Etch-a-Sketch that plugs into your television. I've always wanted to try one of these, and it has a cartridge port. I wonder what that's for. Anyway, very cool. Uh, moving along, we have a Brain Baffler. Uh, never heard of this one. And look, an original magnetic Etch-a-Sketch. <laughs> I wonder if it still works. And it does. Drawing on these things was always such a challenge. And the Etch-a-Sketch Animator. I think this is the original thing that we had discussed in the email. All of this other stuff has been a bonus, I guess. Anyway, I've always wanted to try one of these out, and I've come across a few in thrift shops or estate sales, but they're always broken and abused. So uh, yeah, I'll be interested to try this out. Um, so yeah, here's all the eight things that were in that box. So uh, thank you. Okay guys, you can definitely stop emailing me about this now. I have received a sous vide cooker. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, this was not mailed to me, but in fact it was hand delivered by Christopher Fosky. So um, let's take this thing out of the box and look at it. And the reason I've gotten like 800 emails about this product is because I mentioned I wanted to try retro writing something by placing it in a large tub of heated water. And uh, this is the product everyone suggested I should use. And apparently it has controls for setting an exact temperature. So uh, this just might work. And I'll definitely give this a try in a future video. So a uh, big thanks to Chris as uh, these definitely aren't cheap. Next up is a box from Germany. Apparently from Arna Schmitz. The customs paper says it is a computer sound card. And here's a note. It appears this is an AdLib replica. Wow, check that out. Uh, this is really cool because genuine AdLib cards are insanely expensive and rare these days. Very cool. Uh, you'll definitely see this again in future videos. Uh, thank you, Arno. And the next box is from Chris Lazaga, and he has sent many quality donations in the past. Okay, uh, this looks like some sort of laptop and a battery pack, no doubt long dead. And how do you open this thing? <laughs> okay, that's uh, just a carry handle. Oh, that's not a screen, it's actually a keyboard cover. Ah, so there's the screen. What a fascinating little portable. I've never seen one of these before. Apparently it stores data on these little micro cassettes. That is so cute. <laughs> Look at that. Apparently this is some sort of modem attachment, so yeah, I guess it connects to the bottom of the laptop like this, and that's what the giant ribbon cable is for. Well, uh, thank you Chris, I'll see what I can do to get this working. Next box is from Dimitri K. Let's see what's inside. Ah yes, so um, he saw where I mentioned that some jerk had taken my Osborne handle and never returned it, so uh, he found another one somewhere and here it is. Obviously it needs retrobriting, but I'll have to figure out a way to retrobrite it without damaging the leather this time. So uh, that should make a neat challenge. Uh, thank you Dimitri, uh, you'll be seeing this again. Okay, uh, so this is an interesting box. It appears to be from Puckaway Motor Club. I expect to see blue painter's tape over these addresses. Well. You got your wish. And it says here, do not <laughs> cut with a knife, but he says, nah, go ahead. Over here it's the same thing. He says, nah, seriously, it's okay. Die Thomas Earth food grade. Food grade? Who would eat this? I use it to kill ants. Over here it says, not really from this website. If you are expecting some actual diatomaceous earth, prepare to be disappointed. These guys are very proud of their website, and yet I bought this on Amazon. And the other sign that says, do not open this in. You are likely to be eaten by a Gru? I don't even know what that is. Okay, well, we know what it isn't, so uh, let's see what's actually inside the box. Um, here's a note from Puckaway Motor Club, and it appears to be Atari cartridges. Wow, uh, so there's a bunch of game manuals. I don't have most of these. And here are two large bricks worth of games. Uh, let's open these up. So it looks like the ones on the left here are Atari 2600 cartridges. Um, Adventure is kind of an interesting one I've been wanting to get my hands on because it was recently used in the movie Ready Player One. And um, these are all Coleco games. 
And that's interesting, as I didn't even know that GORF was available on the Coleco. These actually say ColecoVision and Atom, so they're for the computer as well as the game console. And Smurf, uh, I've never played this before, that should be interesting. Next up is a package from Landon Balk. Uh, what the heck is this? Okay, I know what this is. Um, it's a drum machine. And I remember the email conversation, but I actually had no idea it was this large. And um, here's a letter to 8-bit keys. Let's see what it says. So, long story short, the LCD doesn't work on this thing, and he thought maybe I could fix it. So, um, yeah, it's an RX-15. I'll just plug it in right quick and uh, see what it does. Apparently, the unit actually works, but uh, this is all the screen displays. Well, I'll have a crack at fixing it in a later episode. Uh, thank you, Landon. Next up, we have a small little box here from James Labar. Here's a little note. Apparently, these are Timex Sinclair cassettes, which is cool because I'm planning a documentary on that machine sometime this year. And here they are. I noticed some of them, like chess uh, here, require 16K of RAM, where others just require the standard 2K. And these are in great condition. Uh, thank you, James. And next we have a box from Interworld Highway. Actually, I later discovered this was a drop shipment from Pete Brown. And uh, what we have here is a desoldering tool. Um, often people are suggesting I get these little $5 pumps and stuff, which I've tried all of those and they're junk, so I just don't use them. Uh, this, on the other hand, will probably work really well. Of course, I can't imagine what this costs. Uh, probably a few hundred dollars if I had to guess. Well, let's open it up. Uh, yeah, this thing will probably work great. Um, well, I'll undoubtedly be using this next time I need to desolder a chip or something in a repair video, so uh, thank you very much, Pete. Next up, we have a fairly large box from Michael Lathbury. Very interesting packing method. Ah, uh, yes, I remember this conversation. This is a Yamaha VSS-30, which is a digital voice sampling keyboard, sort of like the Casio SK-1 or the SK-5, like this one. I've never actually played with one of these, so uh, after I get it cleaned up, I'll be curious to see what it can do. <laughs> these stickers always baffle me. I've seen these on so many keyboards, and you know they're usually placed there by the original owners, of course, probably 30 years ago. But it always amazes me how randomly placed they always are, like they didn't even try to line them up. Anyway, uh, thank you very much, Michael. Next up, we have a box from Samuel. Hmm, what is this? It just says Atari on it. Ah, neat. It's a cartridge holder. I've never actually seen one like this before. And I do not believe I have any of these games. I think I sent him a list of the ones I had, so uh, he found some ones that was missing. Alright, well, uh, thank you, Samuel. Next, we have a box from 1097. <laughs> actually, that's just the address of the UPS store. Uh, so this is actually from Peter Metzger. And here's a note. And there's a C64 cartridge in there called Dance Fantasy. I'm not even familiar with that one. This is the color tone keyboard for the Commodore 64. And what's interesting is uh, this thing is completely flat. And when he sent me the photo, I got the impression there were real keys on it. Oops, <laughs> not that it matters, I would have still taken it. Apparently it plugs into the joystick port of the Commodore 64, and now I'll have to try to locate the software for it. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much, Peter. Moving along, here's a box from The Future was 8-Bit, and they're always sending me cool stuff. Uh, this comes from overseas, and the customs paperwork says Computer Parts Kit. Hmm. Okay, it uh, looks like they sent me several things, and here's a note. Okay, uh, first thing we have here is a 264 diagnostic cartridge, so this would work on the Commodore Plus 4 and probably the C16 as well. And next we have a C64 dead test cartridge, and these are handy for troubleshooting the C64. I already had one of these, but uh, it didn't have this fancy case on it, so that's cool. Okay, and the next one is a modern Epix fastload cartridge. I think this one has been modified to be more compatible with the SD2 IEC, so that's cool. Plus it gives you a reset button, which the C64 really needs. Speaking of, this appears to be another SD to IEC device. These are SD card readers for basically any Commodore machine. Now, I already had one of these, but apparently this one is made from original VIC-20 cases that were melted down, according to the note. I can't understate how handy these are for getting new software on your Commodore machines. And this appears to be a cassette case for a game, but there's no cassette inside. 
And the last, but definitely not the least, is a new Penultimate Plus cartridge for the VIC-20. I had the previous version of this and even did a video on it a while back, and this one is supposed to be even better. Yeah, and there it is. It's in two colors now. <laughs> Very cool. Well, thank you for all this great swag. Next up is a box from Belgium, and that's a lot of stamps. This is from Serge, who always has these neat inventions that he creates, and uh, let's see what he's made this time. Okay, so uh, this is the new version of the parallel port AdLib card. The old one used an OPL2 chip, and the new one uses a surface mount OPL3 chip, which is still fully backwards compatible with the AdLib. But uh, yeah, I definitely like the layout on this one better, especially the location of the volume knob. And this here is a MIDI synthesizer for the parallel port, and I think it's based on his Dream Blaster product. This should be interesting as another sound option for laptops and other old DOS machines. I'll have to play around with this. And what do we have here? Okay, apparently these are cases for the OPL3 cards. So yeah, they just snap on like that. And the same thing for the MIDI synth cards. And the last thing he sent me. This is a prototype, apparently. And it will convert old RGBI signals, including Hercules, CGA, and EGA, over to VGA. And this should be handy for using a modern monitor with my old Tandy 1000 machines. Uh, this will be interesting to try. So yeah, you connect the RGBI on one side, and then VGA connects to the other. Next up is yet another package from the future was 8-bit. Okay. This is apparently a new ROM for the penultimate cartridge. Uh, he said there was a bug in the version he sent me, although I haven't noticed it. Uh, might as well install it now. So we'll just pull the old one out. And then I'll stick the new one down in there. And um, let's go ahead and try it out. Yep, seems to be working. And while we're at it, I'll show you a few things on this cartridge. Uh, they redid the whole main menu. It looks so cool now. It also includes a lot of new games. Uh, for example, it now includes Cheese and Onion. It also has a great version of Tetris on here. And it even includes Pentagorat. All some great games for the VIC-20. Moving along, here's a package from David Sherpke. Let's see what this is. Here's a note. Aha! <laughs> These are Commodore Plus 4 cartridges, and these are super rare as there weren't many cartridges made for the machine. It's a pity I couldn't have gotten these a few weeks ago. I could have shown them in the Plus 4 documentary that I did. Uh, nevertheless, I'm still thrilled to have them. Uh, thank you, David. And this package sneaked in right at the last minute. It's uh, pretty heavy. I have no idea what's in it. It's from Genevieve Catalano. Okay, let's see what's inside. It appears to be several books. It appears to be for some Kpro software. Hmm, MS-DOS? That means it can't be for the CPM machines. Okay, here's a note that explains it. Yeah, this is from the same family that sent me the big trunk full of old Kpro laptops. Uh, apparently these books go with that. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you, Genevieve. All right, guys, and a big thanks for everything that was donated. I did want to do a little bit of self-promotion here right quick. <laughs> I made kind of a big mistake recently, and I bought 155 Commodore VIC-20 motherboards uh, from this guy, and uh, I probably shouldn't have, but I have managed to get about 80 of them working, and uh, I'm literally like, the walls are closing in on me here, so I would absolutely love it if you guys would go uh, take some of these off my hands. They're also, um, they are available on my website, and I also got uh, 55 of these Commodore 16 keyboards, and again, I don't know what I'm gonna do with all of these, so again, uh, Please take these off my hands. Anyway, um, I guess that wraps it up for this episode. So uh, you're going to be seeing a lot of the stuff that uh, was donated in this episode in some follow-up episodes really soon. I'm actually working on an episode right now on several of those sound cards like the AdLib and the SSI and some of those um, little parallel port cards and stuff like that. So you'll be seeing that here in just a few days, hopefully. So uh, anyway, uh, thanks for watching.